All right, let's talk about magnetic particle inspection. Magnetic particle. Basics. Basics. So magnetic particle inspection. An NDT method that is used to reveal surface and near surface, also called subsurface, discontinuities in ferromagnetic parts. We've got a lot to write. So it is an NDT method. NDT method. Method that is used to reveal surface and near surface, which is to say subsurface, discontinuities, in ferromagnetic parts. So what does that mean exactly? Metal. Non-destructive testing, testing method used to reveal surface. Okay, we know what a surface crack is. Yes. Open to the surface, which means it could then you could use porous and penetrate if you so desired. Um, and near surface, which is below the surface. So the crack does not have to be open to the surface, which is different now than uh, penetrant testing. So, and, but it must be in ferromagnetic parts, which means. They are iron ferrous, magnetic. iron, and parts that can be magnetic. Can you do fluorescent penetrant inspection or, or penetrant inspection on a ferromagnetic part? Absolutely. Yes. yes, you can. What would be the preferred method? NDT. Yeah, yeah, NDT. Yes, NDT <laughs> is the whole thing. Yes. I, 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 <laughs> lots of acronyms, okay? I'm just squirting out the first one. I've ever I, I, would, I always prefer, my personally, a magnetic particle. All right, so major limitations. Parker's like, I knew that guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that guy's my company commander. Uh, so um, material must be ferromagnetic. In other words, it must be magnetic, iron and magnetic. Um, can only detect surface and near surface discontinuities. What is near surface? Like, what's the what's the limitate? What's the limiting? Depth? Based upon. The keto ring, it would be about that far. Oh yeah, the keto ring. I was, I was going to say that too because, uh, like on one of the crankshafts we did, you put two thousand amps through it. Yeah. But like on a keto ring, that would only show four or five of those yeah. little things. So it, I wouldn't imagine that it gets too deep in there. So. Right. So for those of you who don't know what a keto ring is, which would be group three, this is a keto ring. And we're going to use it in the magnetic in the Magnaflux machine, which is a misnomer, but I'll say it anyway. And these are holes that are drilled into it at varying depths. Here's the depths that they go into. And you are supposed to pick up up to six indications at 3,400 amps DC. One, two, three, four, five, six, right there. Uh, one, two, three, five, six. So that would be 0.42 of an inch down. So you're not going to, and you're going to have a hard time at that even. Uh, but based upon this, upwards to a little less than half an inch. Anything more than that, you will not see it. As opposed to ultrasound, which if you guys, have, once you start looking at the ultrasound, it goes real deep. I don't even know what the limitation of that is. It's certainly well over eight inches. Even our little machine will easily do eight inches. I think one of the books mentioned about 20 inches was the effective for most. 
But yeah, then it depends on what you're doing because there's like the water immersion. Uh, there's all these different methods. So thank you for that. So what, yeah, what would you years. normally ultrasound on something like like what type of part? Uh, okay, well anything. But one good example is that uh, continental crankshafts, unless they change something, require not only a magnetic particle inspection, but they also require an ultrasound inspection on all six cylinders up in the front area by a qualified continental technician. Uh, rotor blades for helicopters. Do they both do both though? Or they, they, do, they do ultrasonic okay. for sure. But so each one's going to have its its purpose. Uh, major limitations. Let me see. Can we do that? Um, the surface. Surface must be clean and compatible with the medium used. And compatible with the medium used. I don't have an example of an incompatibility problem, but definitely the surface has to be clean. If you have oil, and it's, I, mean, I should put some oil in the, in the uh, Magnaflux machine for you. And by the way, I keep saying that, and I know I'm wrong. It is not called a Magnaflux machine. People that have been in the industry for a very, very long time will all call, will call A and P's A and E's for airframes and engines, because that's what it used to be. So I'll call you an A and E. Um, if you have an IA, an inspection authorization, they'll say an AI, because they, that's the old. Um, everything that was magnetic particle was referred to as a magnaflux machine or magnafluxing, and everything that was penetrant inspection was called Zyglo. So every now and then I slip with these things. So just know I, I try not to, but I, I still do it. So when I say Magnaflux, which is a trade name, I really mean magnetic particle inspection. Um, possibility. I'm going to add that word. Possibility of arc strike. <coughs> So not just a possibility, but a very good probability that you will have an arc strike eventually. It's not a question of if, but a question of when. Probably, yes. So anytime that you have, you're putting a lot of amps through something, thousands, and if you have a part, especially camshafts for some unknown reason, mm -hmm. there's actually because they have that black oxide finish on them and stuff, um, they're not making good contact with the pads, it'll arc through. When it does, it welds a piece of the pad copper pad to the part and that can render it no good because you're not supposed to have copper stuck to it. Uh, all right. Did that kind of happen? Yes. If you were like to, to touch that part and the, you, you get all those amps in you? No. No. My uh, boss did it to me all the time. <laughs> all the freaking time. Um, only because he was a guy who would walk back in there. It's dark, right? So I've been in the dark room all day. I could see just fine. And of course, he would walk in and not have his night vision. So he'd walk all the way to the back of the shop, walk in there, and inevitably step on the pedal that would release something. And so sometimes <laughs> people would come and grab me. I'd reach for it. But at the same time, the, I used the bar on mine to magnetize. He would step on it and lean in. So I would catch the, grab the part as he leaned in and energized it. So I learned right then that I'm not going to die. And so honestly, when we bought this machine and I was talking to our Magnaflux guy, I said, you know, I don't want to sound like an idiot, but I'm just going to, I got to ask, how come I don't get hurt when I've got 3000 amps running through a part and I'm hanging on to it? And the answer was obvious. It was right in front of me. Um, as we already learned in um, electricity, you have, more resistance. you have a lot of resistance on the outside of you, dry callus hand or wet if it's in there. Uh, so you have a lot of resistance. There's very little voltage. So if you look at high amps and the voltage, it takes more voltage to break this barrier than is being put out. So, and the part has no resistance. For God's sakes, it's a two inch bar. So no resistance whatsoever. So the current just goes through that. It doesn't really care what you're doing. Plus you're in parallel with it, so. Voltage is the pressure, amperage is the Right, so there's just not enough pressure. <clears throat> All right, theory of magnetization. Mm -hmm. 
We talked about this, I think, reasonably well when we talked about magnetos, about the little domains inside, the domain theory, and also the theory that uh, molecules tend to line up when they're magnetized so that all of the, so they create a magnetizing force. When everything's in alignment, then it creates a north and a south end. So when a part is magnetized, the domains, this is my favorite theory, the domains, or molecules if you will, have their north and south poles oriented. So I like to look at it or think about it kind of like. Wait, so north and south poles, what's that word? Orientation. Orientation. Look at that. So I have a piece of something there. And within that, I have all of these, if you will, little bar magnets all over the place in there. Right? Or you can think molecules. And see, north, we'll put north over here, north over here, north up there, south, south, south. So there's all of these little magnets, if you will, inside of a part that is not magnetized. And you can see the north and the south, they're kind of going all different ways. Uh, no rhyme or reason, they're all completely mixed up. And that makes this part non-magnetic because everything within it is scrambled. But we'll do it again. Look at that. When we apply a magnetizing force, now this magnetizing force can be either through direct magnetization or indirect magnetization. Direct would be I'm literally putting amperage through the part. The part is going to get warm when you do that uh, and currents flowing through it. Whoosh, you know, thousand amps, two thousand amps, whatever you're going to do. Or indirect is where I put it in a, a magnetizing coil of some sort or um, subject it to other magnets. We'll get in all the different ways. When that happens, all these little domains in here line up. Good little soldiers in all of the north south, north south, north south, north south. That makes this the north end of the magnet. Now we have a south end of the magnet, and the part is magnetized. And we could do it differently where the north and south go up and down too. But there we are. So we have everything lined up. That part is magnetized. Now to demagnetize it, what do we do? AC pull scramble it. Just got to scramble it. And there's ways to do that. Talk about that. So when the part is magnetized, all the domains are the um, molecules have the north and south poles oriented. So passing current around or through a ferrous part will cause the molecules to line up and the part becomes magnetized. Passing a current around or through a ferrous part, ferrous means iron, around or through a ferrous part will cause the molecules, will cause the molecules or domains, if you will, to line up and the part becomes magnetized. The part becomes magnetized. All right, so we have different kind of magnets, if you will. So first we could look at a bar magnet. a kid, I don't know, I have this little book about magnets. It's like my favorite book in the world. I always love magnets. So a bar magnet. And that would be what I drew earlier. Is a bar. Which has north on one side and south on the other. 
If I break it in half, it becomes two, north, south, north, south. But we have a bar magnet right there. So a bar magnet um, has north on one side, has north <coughs> on one side, and south on the other. The lines of flux. Remember lines of flux? Yes. What are lines of flux? The direction of the... What are lines of flux? Magnetic force. The invisible lines of force. So lines of flux travel through the air in a bar magnet from... North to south. North to south. And I remember that by thinking about the Earth with north on the top and south on the bottom and I think well if we had a magnet inside which we do uh, and they say whoever it is I am they uh, the lines of flux come out of the top and they fall down to the bottom and back in well that's completely false and won't fall but that's how I remember they go from north to south so we have these invisible lines of flux that go from north to south that's what they want you to believe you're aware of it sir we are <laughs> alright lines of flux travel through the air, <coughs> through the air from north to south. I put N to S. See, I can save time and see where I'm going. Yeah, that was really cool when you got that red dot. The what? The, the paper? Yeah. It's actually the next, I wrote this. If iron filings are placed on a paper over a magnet, the filings will line up and show the lines of flux. So for group three, who hasn't had this yet, I will actually use a electric, a, uh, a yoke it's called, an electromagnet. We'll put a piece of paper over it, we'll put iron filings, and you can see it create the lines of flux around it and on top of it. And you can watch how they go. So it's, it's actually pretty cool. It's, so, called, it's called a yoke? The yoke. Yeah. No. I saw, saw a video of someone doing that on, a, on an engine block, and they had all the iron filings on it, and they were using that, and it just didn't look like it was very effective. I don't know if it did. Well, I did it with you, right? Yeah. Oh, no. It's not my favorite. Uh, let's see. If iron filings, all right, if iron filings um, are placed on paper over a magnet, are placed. So on a paper. Over a magnet, the filings will line up and show lines of flux. Because lines of flux are invisible. They do not intersect. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. They don't. Um, and they concentrate down here at the at the ends because they space out as they go around. Uh, if a bar magnet, if a bar magnet is bent into a C shape. I'm going to have to draw that. Uh, the flux will be concentrated at the opening. Let's see here. What will this do? So if I take a magnet, sorry, it's kind of small, isn't it? Can I make it bigger? Can you see it? Yeah. If I take that magnet and I bend it into a C shape, what happens is all of the lines of flux are concentrated right here. There. It's going to do that, kind of a little bulgy thing at the top and the bottom. Alright, 
And then with this right here, we would call that a flux leakage. Right here is a flux leakage. So if this was a part, like a crankshaft, and we'd have the lines of flux actually traveling inside of the part, inside of it, it'd be north to south, or south to north, get to here, cross over, and around. So all those lines of flux are running on the inside, but we have this little flux leakage now at the north-south. That is similar, this would be called circular magnetization, because the magnetization is running in a circle. And where there is a discontinuity, which would be here where they have the, this area right here, because it's not continuous, a discontinuity, or it simulates a crack, we will have a flux leakage. If we put iron filings all over this, they will fall off everywhere except for right here, where they will stick and leave a line on top of it, which I don't have on the drawing, because I'm not cool enough to be like 3D. There we go. Look at that. So the iron filings would all stick right here, which happened to be green, and we would see an indication. Even if it was all the way up to and touching, still have a little bit of flux leakage there. So we would have that. And that is the basic basis of magnetic particle inspection. Now it's everything I just wrote. Um, I'm not gonna write all that. Hopefully you did. Draw the picture. Uh, let's see if, uh, this, if there's a small crack, discontinuity, there's a heavy flux concentration at the crack. I wrote that. Iron filings are then attracted to the flux leakage. I can write some of that. I'll just abbreviate what I wrote. Um, there is a flux leakage at the discontinuity. which attracts the iron filings, indicating a crack. Even if this were uh, sealed up, it's, but there's a discontinuity subsurface, it still leaks out over the top, giving us that indication. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, let's see, let's talk about definitions of things. So that's the basics for, yes. Do you have an example part that we can see a subsurface, subsurface, subsurface discontinuity? The keto spring is the best one. You don't have a real part though? It's pretty real. They're hard to find. <clears throat> Yeah, you don't see them very often. <clears throat> it, not, not in aircraft parts that I work with. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've ever come across this. <coughs> At that point, they already work themselves to the surface pretty much? Uh, okay, so I've caught some that were probably subsurface. And I say that because what I start doing is then start polishing on it. Like, you have an indication. So keep in mind, a lot of the stuff that I'm, I've done to crankshafts, People go, ooh, you're not authorized to do that. Okay, I'm not. So I see something that is rejectable, so I just called it rejected. Now it's no longer an airworthy aircraft part. I can do whatever I want to with it, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I've just deemed it unairworthy. So since I've deemed it unairworthy, I can kind of do whatever I want to legally. So I'll take some sandpaper, crocus cloth, a, 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 a abrasive wheel, a, you know, my drill or something, and I'll start polishing on it, or I can even take it back to my polisher and polish it. Um, but of course, you need to know the dimensions of that because if you're wrong and it was just some sort of false indication, you start doing something stupid to it, now it's red tag, and guess who broke it? You did. And crankshafts are very, very expensive. So you don't want to just do that. You know, the cheapest crankshaft out there is probably at least five grand. And you get into some of the bigger ones, you're probably talking um, six figures. Uh, it's not six, not hundreds though. So it's five figures easily, 
thousand or more. Um, so you, I start polishing on it, and it's kind of a fuzzy indication, but it's definitely there. It keeps coming back, and then you start to polish it, grind on it, remove metal, and suddenly it's a bright, definitive crack. And the more, now you're like, all right, now it's, it's obviously got a crack. It wasn't even developed that well before. Now suddenly it's really defined. So I think it went from a subsurface to a surface. And then if you, the more you go, the brighter it gets and the longer it gets. You're like, oh yeah, this is definitely a subsurface. All right, definitions. For D, definitions. I'm just kind of trying to figure out. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, no. Definition. Let me borrow your glasses real quick. <laughs> uh, magnetic flux. What is magnetic flux? What is that defined as? Flux that's magnetic. Invisible lines of force. Ooh, very good. Well, you Invisible? said it like 15 minutes ago, so I didn't look Yeah, but you remembered and you heard me. Yeah. It's, you cool. know how rare that is? Yeah. <laughs> Give me what five more it? minutes, I want to talk Invisible you. lines <laughs> of force in a magnetic circuit. I know. You're like, ah, circuit, I don't want to hear it. It sounds like electricity. <laughs> Flux density. <laughs> Who's my uh, Back to the Future fans? What, what, what did he say? Okay. You are my density. <laughs> What's her name? Uh, Lorraine. Lorraine. Lorraine, yes. Lorraine, Lorraine you are my density. <laughs> Flux density. The strength is the strength. Of the flux, uh, the flux measured in what? Gauss. Photometers. Gauss. <laughs> A U S S. What's what's the plural of Gauss? Gausses. 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 Yeah. Gauss. 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 Uh, sounds like a disease you get between your toes. I'm not sure about that. Uh, <laughs> the hell? Gausses or Gauss? No Gauss. You a geese meter? Don't look at this stuff. We'll ruin it before I get there. Okay. I remember I said. Yeah. They're good. They're good. Remember slide three? Yeah. All right. So Gausses, geeses. Measured with an indicator. So we have what I could call over here uh, to the right the analog style, which you guys are all familiar with, with working with the magnetos. And please don't max them out, but that will measure your Gauss. Uh, I don't believe that this is any specific number. I think it's just 10. Yeah. It's just a reference line, like an EGT gauge, which you're like, um, that was for you over there. Like an EQT gauge. Oh, yeah. uh, so I don't believe that that is actual measured Gauss in any way, shape, or form. Uh, this over here is a very expensive gauge. I wish I had the price on that one. Uh, somebody who has a computer who's not watching a basketball game can tell me what should look up. And I should put the price tag on all these things. Um, uh, this right here. Gauss meter? Yeah, this Gauss meter right here. Um, probably that one wouldn't. right there. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, 1500. All right. Uh, FW Bell. Yeah, you have to be well. Yeah, 1500 flat. That's it. I've been tripping cheap. I should have bought a couple of them. Oh. So this will actually measure Gauss for you. It actually gives you a Gauss reading with this very sensitive little probe right here, which we do have, and I will work with you on that. Be very careful with it. The field indicator is a 60, the little one, 65 yeah. bucks. But save 5% off. <clears throat> By the way, the right 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 Uh <laughs> Aircraft screw sells them with an additional core charge. It's like four thousand dollars core charge on there. Yeah, so that means it had to be good when you sent it in. 
All right, flux density, we should measure it with the uh, Gauss meter. All right, some words that we've heard before. Permeability. Permeability. What is permeability? The ease with which I'm just going to try and learn how to spell which. Ease with which a magnetic force or I'm sorry, a magnetic flux. The magnetic flux is established in a given material so a material with high permeability <coughs> has low intensity I haven't gotten there yet. Um, is easily magnetized. Is the second part of that definition? Um, it's just a, I suppose I could have moved it in one more like a subsection A. So oh, I see. One, two, three. Really should have been moved in one, but. Ouch. This means the part will also. So, lose its magnetism. Easily. Which means it has low intensity. Very good. Which is the next? No, it should be, but I decided not to. Reluctance. It's the inverse of permeability. <coughs> the opposition to magnetic flux. That's the opposition. Then, yes, then we can talk about retentivity. Which is defined as what? The ability to retain lines of mag magnetism. Very good. The ability of a material, almost word for word. He's just listening to my lecture from last year. It's, it's stopping. I just Google searching all the words. <laughs> <laughs> ability of a material to retain magnetism. I just uh, went on your computer during break and looked at it. Ah. I actually did have one student who would just Google everything I said. I mean, everything. See the MP now? I don't think so. Damn. <laughs> yeah. He's he 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 shut behind us. Is that? I said, you hear two laptops shut behind us. I don't totally mind. I mean, I'm right most of the time. <laughs> You're right enough for it to count. Yes, at least to see, right? Yeah. <laughs> C's get degrees. <laughs> I have a degree. It's not in this stuff. <laughs> Basket weaving. I got a degree in the water. <laughs> All right, uh, retentivity, the ability of a material to re retain magnetism. This is going to be really important. It's not so important when we talked about the uh, magneto because, like, whatever, it's just a rotor. I'm going to do what you tell me. I'm going to put it inside, and then I'm going to run the thing. But you have to constantly think about uh, this stuff when you are doing magnetic particle inspection. You have to think about what is the uh, retentivity of this, what is the reluctance of this, and, and how you're going to treat it, and how many amps you're going to do it, uh, put into it, and the methods and process that you're going to use. It's something that you're constantly thinking about. And if you're not thinking about it, then you should be. Is there a way to gauge specific, like, specific items? Like, like, will the manufacturer tell, like, oh, this is highly permeable, or like, it's just kind of... No, no, they don't. And I think I've, I've mentioned this many times. <clears throat> so I'm 
mention it once for everybody. Yeah, I'm just <coughs> When I was doing magnetic particle inspection on Lycomings and Continentals and various other engines, there was a service bulletin from both Lycoming and Continental. And it just talked about how to do magnetic particle inspection on all of the engine parts. And it was really cut and dry, just, boom, there it is. Um, very little information, but it would just say something like, item, crankshaft. Uh, method, circular and longitudinal, amps, 2,000, areas to look at, uh, radiuses, fillets, flanges, it would just give you the critical areas like were, and it was done. Next line, uh, gears below six inches, uh, you know, longitudinal, circular, are on a bar, and you know, between teeth, and then 1,500 amps. So it was just very basic, and it's kind of left for you to kind of go, oh, okay, we'll figure it out. But, I think that's good because then I sort of learned and was able to take that information rather than today it's a little different. You don't have access to that anymore because you're expected to be working with a level three and you're supposed to be level two handing down uh, processes which aren't that big of a deal. We're just going to look at the basic uh, formulas for doing this stuff and you go, oh yeah, that's pretty much what Lycoming like Continental said to do. How, how cool is that? They just made it real simple. They said, oh, do it at 2,000. But now you have to do math now to come at, you know, this times that and multiply times this and cross section my area and it equals 2,000. Yeah. So before you would get a part and you would look through all the ADs to make sure that it's been done on those parts before then going through with your actual NDT? Process? No. My process and didn't make the boss real happy at first, but then he understood my method is that any engine that came in, we would just take a lot of photos of it, and a lot of this was even before digital photography, so we have thousands of photos to this day we still have somewhere. We would photograph the engine, then I would have somebody disassemble it, clean it, um, they would disassemble it on, a, on everything, had a, a big cart, and it was a cart about this size of this table, but it was you know four shelves, and every engine got its either its own cart or its own shelf and it was all clearly labeled that was all part of the repair station and so then uh Basile was my guy so Basile would wheel it out we had a tough shed it was our cleaning area we had the big hot seat which oh, that thing was hot I mean it's twice as hot as this one it was oh, just below boiling mm -hmm. and then right here was our um uh, uh, stoddard solvent so stoddard solvent is an uh I'll say oil based but it's a uh, um it is oil based you know, it's not it's not oily a little bit um, and then we had the dip which changed over the years um, mm -hmm. so everything would get hot sea washed get all the oil grease everything off of it if it was a steel part then it would get started solvent washed because that displaces the water and gave it a, a, at least a temporary corrosion protection but we were at next to the river so things rusted real fast um, and then uh, we had the dip which was a hot sea product it was like forget what it was, but it was somewhat of a paint stripper, soap, very alkali soap. We would just drop stuff in on a big shelf and go down in this big tank. Tank's about the size of this table. Everything's the size of this table. Um, good size. Good, good size. Now, when I first started, it was a little different. So it's worth telling the story. I wish you could see it like I could see it still in my mind. We had this tank, and it had this stuff called Turco in it. And if you don't know what Turco smells like, you haven't lived because it's horrific. Um, I feel like we have lived. We if you ever, I think I brought in, anybody ever smelled that B12 carburetor cleaner? Not the spray stuff, but the stuff you open the lid. I, there's some here. I had, I ordered some. I thought it was the spray, but it was this stuff. To get it here, I had to put it in like three bags and, and like to get it in my car because the smell just makes me crazy. But remind me tomorrow, I'll get it out. Like, oh, crap. Um, okay, some of your engines that you'll work on next <laughs> semester still have a hint of it, and I will stinks like turco um, so this turco stuff was terrible if you got a, if it got on you it burned but the guys that had been there for years they didn't even know they just cigarette in their mouth they just you know they're the end of their finger <laughs> i found this can of um it was msa uh, mine safety something or another and it was this type of it was labeled as a um, invisible glove and before i even got near it i would pack this stuff in my fingernails get my hands and I would get like tall rubber gloves to get near it because it stuck so bad and every time you worked on it and you went anywhere 
And you've got a store or anything, people, it's not electrical fire. No, it's just me. You're like, no, seriously, a ballast is going out or something. Like, no, I'm telling you, it's just me. When I leave, you won't smell it anymore. And like, every time, I swear, it's so bad. And so, well, there you go. It smells like electrical fire. This stuff is terrible. And the process was, um, so you would put parts in this stuff, and if you put magnesium in, it would eat it up overnight. It was, you couldn't put mag, so you only could put it in for a couple hours. Tomato. I don't know. So you <laughs> got this rack, you know, with, with a, with a uh, pulley system, a uh, block and tackle. So you lift it up, and your parts would come up after being in there. I mean, everything would, it just, I mean, the, the uh, carbon just fell off. The paint would just slide right off. Yeah. And then we would take it right out the door and sit it down. On, it was just on the ground. It was a, 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 a pallet. They had a pallet there with a jerry can full of a soldered solvent and one of those uh, aerosol cans, you know, like a su it would suck it up. So it's you hook it up to an air hose and you blow it. It's an air nozzle with a suction on it. So it's kind of like, and well, Danny always got there with a cigarette, man. You know, <laughs> aerosol stuff. Okay, here's the fun part. So so we'd wash it off. This, oh, no, sorry. We'd first wash, water wash it. Just the hose. Just turn on the hose and just hose it all off. And then we do the stoddard solvent. Well, we do all that, but guess where the well was to feed everything? <laughs> it was like from here to our water cooler away. Actually closer than that. So we contaminated the well like freaking crazy. Um, and they've been doing this since before World War II. I was going to say the... Uh... Oh, and the river, the river was close. Like, if I'm here, the river would be, you guys would be parked in the river because the levee was literally right here. Um, <laughs> you still buy this stuff? You said yes, it, you can. What was the stuff that smelled like too much? Like, invisible blood? Oh, I don't know. Um, just but until we got a new owner came in who um, was somewhat environmentally conscious and said, okay, <laughs> we're not doing this anymore. So we did. We, we, we went to environmentally friendly, the hot sea stuff, water based stuff. So he's just dog solvent. But we carted stuff off and you know, to not contaminate the river. But I was going to say, imagine going on like an airliner and you've got that stuff on your hands and the last is just freaking out. So, but what was your question anyway? Uh, so the process. Uh, just kidding. Okay, just so kidding. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. $431. We can get you a set of 12 five gallon containers. <laughs> of Turco? Of Turco. Uh, well, this is Turco Altrex Alkaline Cleaner. Um, I think it has to be the original Turco. I don't. It, and they probably don't even make it anymore because they, they had a guy in a turbo. Which is is probably, it pale yellow? Oh, I don't even know what it was. Just one of the freaking oh, tanks. Well, the color it says color is pale yellow. But I don't it's know. Potassium hydroxide, so, sodium okay. silicate, sodium gluconate, ethoxylated. Yeah, would know what that is. Let's just say it stinks. The B12 smells just like it. The chemical. <laughs> so so you, you were mentioning that it was in the service bowl of Dennis for these parts. Okay, that that's did. right. So, so, what you be, so anyway, the service bowl I told you that story to tell you this story. Now you see you're getting me all off track and stuff. So uh, the parts were cleaned back on the cart. Um, then I took over, right? So I would start with a visual and dimensional inspection of everything. Um, like when I did the crankshaft, the crankshaft would get a very light polish on the crankshaft polisher with a very dull belt. I kept dull, used up belts and did almost nothing just to knock the boogers and stuff off of them without taking off material. So somebody couldn't say, oh, you over polished. Uh, measure it, dimensionally check, all that stuff that you're gonna do. Um, do the whole engine, everything I was gonna keep, dimensionally check, make a list of what was there. Now at that point, I had seen all of the engine. I was very, I was getting into it with the engine. Then at that point, when I first started doing this, I had to take my light combing service bulletins, and I use a light combing. And if you haven't seen the light combing service bulletins, in paper, they're that tall. All right, and so I went through, I, so I would take a, a piece of, um, uh, just a binder, um, tablet, and I would just write every service bulletin applicable to that engine, right? Just all the way down, every, every line on the, my legal pad had the service bulletin, then I would, so now I know all the applicable service bulletins, I would go to the service bulletin and write a, a brief thing. Some of them were just very quick. Um, introducing new fuels, don't interest it. Inter you know, uh, converting from one oil to another, not interested. You know, I would just make a, a few word sentence, uh, oil conversion, um, adding this, taking away that. And then anything that was applicable, um, like maybe I'd get to a service bulletin that said, when converting it, when installing the new oil pump gears, you must. I'll like circle that one, put a little star. Okay, I'm gonna be putting new oil pump gears. What do they want me to do? Well, they want me to modify an oil passage, so I gotta do that. So I would look at every single service bolt. Now, you know, first of all, it's like, what have you been doing all day? Because there's a lot of them. 
but you know literally then at the end of the day or towards the end of the project when i had this awesome engine that had every service bolt we complied with it was how in the hell did you know to do that we've never done that here in the shop before who taught you this i'm like this is in the book it's so hard right um do the same thing with airworthiness directives and i've told you guys this before and it's when you're reading airworthiness directives and service bulletins you don't look at oh this only applies to serial number this through that that might have effect i don't care what are you talking about I have the engine apart, I'm looking at it. Because maybe it says, oh, this only applies to oil pump gears that were installed in these engines from the, you know, I could spend 30 or 40 minutes trying to figure out when was the engine overhauled? What is the serial number range? What were shops have been to? Or I could just pick up the, yep, that's not what they're talking about. Or, yep, that's the, that's the part, that's what they're talking about. And it doesn't matter, you know, because what they're trying to lead you down is these engines have these parts. I just pick up the part and go, yeah, it's applicable. So then I'd make a list of that, make a list of the parts. Um, during the inspection, I usually did the inspection when I was doing the visual dimensional. Then the next day I would go into um, NDT with the engine. Because you can't make a parts list if you don't know what you need. If I need a crankshaft, it's like, well, nice to know before you order the parts. So then at that point, like if it needed, per se, a new crankshaft, you wouldn't even look at the old one? Well, if... No, because you're dimensionally checking it. So it start with dimensionally checking it. Okay. Right? And right. so um, crankshafts can be standard. Depends on the manufacturer. Continental goes standard or 10, 10 under. So it uh, was, wasn't in specs. Then I would have to send it out for a regrind or light combing. Back then, it could go standard, polish to three, grind to six, and renitride, grind to 10, and renitride. So I could polish to three. They don't want you to do that anymore. They want to renitride it on the spot. So you had to make up all these decisions and then I would put in you know, the cylinders, then I would put together a sheet for the owner of all the options. Like here is your, and everything I did was pretty much a new spec. So it'd be like, here's your engine to new specs with new cylinders. You know, these are whatever cylinders were the most expensive, best at the time. Or we can do, you know, your engine with these cylinders, which aren't as good, but less, or I can do your engine here with overhauled cylinders. And so I give them all free prices and various options that I can do, and then they would make the decision, and then off it went. That's what I do. What was the general consensus for purchasing? What did most people want? Yeah. Uh, when I was doing it, most people I could get to go um, superior cylinders. Superior was pretty much the best product you could get back then. ECI was really good too. They're not in business anymore. They sold out. You get it up somewhere. Uh, residual magnetism. I'm not going to get this. You guys haven't had voice dictate on? Just take me down today? Uh, how many pages do you have? Amount of magnetism. That remains. In a material. after the magnetizing force is removed. In the, when you do a headshot, it, it just magnetizes it and then it stops. So is it, is it, it has residual magnetism even when it's still in the head? Yes. So it's not, it's only like... Now I'm jumping ahead a little bit for some of you. So if you're doing a head shot with, the, with um, wet continuous, in theory what happened is as the media is on it and flowing and you did the uh, head shot, it's almost like freezing it in time. It creates the uh, magnetic lines of flux. It causes the flux leakage. The filings go to it and then they, they, they just stay there. They don't flow. Mm. That's but why you have to you, wet it first. If you disturb it, those indications will flow away. So that's why it's important not to disturb it. Again, I just jumped ahead for some of you. We'll, we'll circle back around to that for group three. Uh, material properties. So putting what we just talked about into this, we have soft irons. 
Soft is a relative term. If you get hit in the head with it, it will not feel soft. Just like a softball. Mm -hmm. soft <laughs> Low carbon steel, so not much carbon in it. Camshafts in, in uh, a lot of the area, connecting rods. I think the middle of some gears, but not the teeth. Uh, well, they're just hardened, so I don't care what I say. Um, they have high permeability, which means what? Easy to magnetize. <clears throat> so it's easily magnetized. But has low, low, low retentivity. Low retentivity. So you want to think about that when you're magnetizing or inspecting a part. You have to think about, okay, am I going to do, and we'll talk about a little bit, wet continuous or can I do residual? Um, hard irons. Or high carbon steel. Would have low permeability So hard to magnetize, what's that mean? It has high retentivity. Well, I was thinking I'm going to have to put a lot of amps into it to get oh. it to do what I want it to do. And high retentivity. Which means uh, retains magnetism. Which, once you get those two things down, I'll just make this note and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Then we can talk about a hysteresis loop. Hysteresis loop? Um, yeah. yeah. Hysterectomy? <laughs> a hysteresis loop. A history of rhesus? History of rhesus. Uh, like fruit loops for rhesus? That actually was Founded by Professor Loop.